Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. On today's pod, SBF was found guilty in one of the biggest financial frauds on record. Then daylight savings time ends this Sunday, but should it exist at all? It's Friday, November 3rd. Let's ride. The Morning Brew Daily team is busy planning for our holiday episodes, and for one of them that's focused on entrepreneurship, we are looking for your help. Yes, we want you to send us your best business ideas so we can critique them. I'm talking about the ones you've, that have been languishing in the notes app for years, the good stuff. Neil and I, as well as two special guests, will go full Shark Tank on them to see if you're sitting on a gold mine or not. We've already gotten a couple good ones so far. Here's my favorite. Shazam for plants. Just sit with that one for a sec, Neil. So I take a picture of a plant. Neil, and we don't need to debate it now, but yes, you're on the right track. Okay. Shazam for plants. That might exist. Yeah, it could, but I still like it. Before we get into the news, we have a quick word from our sponsor, Brex. As we head into the weekend, I had an idea. What if I, Toby, had a Brex-like spend management platform, but specifically for my weekend spending habits? Okay, I see where you're going with this. You want to keep yourself in compliance with your weekday self, close the books faster after a night out, and stay on budget in real time. I like it. Yes, give Weekend Me a corporate card managed by Monday through Friday, Toby, powered by Brex's best-in-class spend management platform, and I will be a happy camper. So whether you're a business owner, startup founder, or Toby on the weekend, visit Brex.com for more info. Let's head to the news. Sam Bankman-Fried went from being a billionaire hobnobbing with Tom Brady in the Bahamas to a broke, convicted fraudster who faces maybe a lifetime behind bars. The 31-year-old former CEO of FTX was found guilty by a jury on all seven charges of fraud and conspiracy. The sentencing for these charges, which carry up to 115 years in prison, is scheduled for March 28, 2024. SBF is expected to appeal. The jury took just over four hours yesterday, including dinner, to conclude that SBF stole $8 billion worth of customer funds from his crypto exchange FDX to fund risky investments, political contributions, and luxury real estate. The conviction ends a five-week trial that saw three of SBF's former top advisors, including his ex-girlfriend Caroline Ellison, testify that he was the mastermind behind the years-long con. Near the end of the trial, SBF took the stand to paint himself as someone who made mistakes but did not knowingly steal from customers. Apparently, he was not very convincing because he said he couldn't remember details more than 140 times during cross-examination. We've talked about the SBF saga endlessly on this show, so if I had to put a bow on it, it's that we have just witnessed one of the biggest financial frauds on record and the stunning rise and fall of a person who, like many other white-collar criminals before him, convinced the world he built something revolutionary when it was all just a smokescreen to fill his own piggy bank. It is amazing how badly this trial went for SBF. Taking the stand was just a masterclass of everything that was wrong with SBF from the beginning because he thought he could talk his way out of it. He thought he could portray himself as something that he wasn't, which is kind of the through line throughout this entire process. The, SB, the, the prosecution came with receipts. SBF certainly did not. The jury only deliberated for just that couple of hours. And honestly, the, the sheer amount of couldn't recall that he put out there just was emblematic of everything that was wrong with SBF at an organizational level as well. Yeah, and before the show, you, I, and the rest of the team were kind of reminiscing about FTX's rise, and it was truly stunning. I mean, he founded this firm in 2019. SBF didn't really know anything about crypto before this. He just saw an opportunity in crypto to make a lot of money, which he did for himself. He became worth $23 billion, which was the fastest. He became the youngest person to reach that amount of wealth since Mark Zuckerberg. And then during the pandemic, when there was all this crypto, so high, people were just sitting at home with nothing to do. Uh, we, you started to see FTX everywhere. I mean, the Miami Heat started playing at FTX Arena. There, if you would watch an F1 race, there was an FTX ad everywhere. MLB uniform, Empire uniforms had FTX. You saw this guy, uh, you know, in commercials with Tom Brady and Larry David. The Super Bowl had FTX commercials. He spent so much money, and at the time we were all like, "Wait, what is FTX <laughs> yeah. exactly?" And now it's revealed to be a massive fraud. Yeah, it was so. Consistent. 
inconspicuous during that time. Also, just crypto in general would love to put this chapter to rest because, I mean, the industry as a whole has gone to scandal to scandal over the past few years. They all kind of linked into each other as well. Remember the Terra debacle, which caused $60 billion of market funds to be wiped out. And then you had the Celsius crypto exchange that also imploded. FTX obviously blew up. And the industry is still facing just a lot of heat from the SEC. It's brought more than two dozen crypto-related cases since FTX has collapsed. So it's pretty recently as well. And a lot of them are looking into the very nature of crypto tokens themselves and whether or not they violate security laws. So there's not as many flash criminal cases in the pipeline but a lot of boring but still existential ones are, are yeah. still facing the industry yeah i mean the new york attorney general just sued gemini which is run by the winklevoss twins for defrauding mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of customers and losing one billion dollars so there's all these percolating cases that are happening that maybe pose an even more existential crisis to crypto than ftx which was kind of this big whale that kind of was separate from it mm -hmm. but Speaking to SBF, I think the reason that he became such this larger than life figure was because of his aspirations beyond crypto. I mean, he was such a big figure in Washington, D.C. because of his political contributions. He said he had a 5 percent chance of being president. And he was this leader of this effective altruism uh, movement, which professed to give away all of your wealth to help out the world. So he just became this larger than life figure, even though he was kind of like a, a dweeb. Um, <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, people loved him, but he was yeah. kind of a dweeb. Um, and so I think it was just his bigger picture looking and his overall philosophical pinings that kind of made this, you know, a little bit bigger than just the crypto industry. It was big. All right, Neil, we are in the thick of earnings seasons. And even though you may have caught a headline or two or seen that stock up or this stock down, it can all jumble together at some point. So we've picked out some of the most important companies, as well as one big thing that stood out to us from each one to bring you up to speed on what's going on in the market. Up first, we have a little company called Apple. Apple re reported its fiscal fourth quarter earnings yesterday, and we got a bit of a mixed bag. They beat analyst expectations overall for revenue, but sales of its key devices once again slid for the fourth quarter in a row, mainly powered by a 2.5% drop in sales in China iPhone sales were flat. Wearables like the Apple Watch revenue fell 3%. Revenue from iPads was also down 10%. But the big loser were Mac sales, falling nearly 34% year over year. The bright spot was services revenue that included things like Apple Fitness and iCloud. The segment is undefeated, Neil. Revenue was up 16% to a record $22.3 billion. And a big reason why overall revenue was up, even though device sales were down. But my big takeaway goes back to that Mac sales number. Again, Mac sales were down 34%, but Cook & Co. are bullish on the M3 chip it revealed on Monday, which is the most advanced chip Apple has ever created, hoping it can reignite demand. Some important context is the Mac sales are being compared to an all-time record fourth quarter from last year when a lot of pent-up demand exploded into higher than normal sales. But still, my takeaway is that Apple needs the M3 to put Mac sales on its back. Yeah, my takeaway here is that eventually Apple's going to become a software company. It because har every single hardware uh, business unit declined except the iPhone. Meanwhile, services continue to grow in double digits every single year. And eventually, I mean, what did it do? $22 billion in sales. Yeah. And I think in total, Apple did 80 or 90 billion in sales this quarter. Yeah. So eventually, you're going to see services growth top uh, top iPhone sales. And we're going to be talking about this company as a software company. And they recently jacked up prices, as we talked mm -hmm. about. Apple TV Plus went from $6.99 a month to $9.99 a month. And with iPhone sales plateauing, because how many times do you need a new iPhone, which is it's kind of a mature industry. And like we said, all the other segments are kind of languishing like Macs and iPads. I mean, they're just doing a really good job of this pivot to services. I think they, they mentioned they have a over 1 billion subscriptions across its entire portfolio. So it would not be incorrect to call it a, a software company at this point. I just don't know what's going on with the iPad. <laughs> I, you're, you can't you can't figure out what's going on with Macs, but they didn't release a new computer. But I, and I they didn't also release a new iPad. But iPad's down ten percent. Uh, this segment brought in six point four four billion. I have you 
No. Do you have an iPad? I I actually had one when it first came out. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Never touched one again. I think it's big in schools. Yeah, it, it's great for smaller personal computing when you don't want but to I, shell out. Yeah, I've just never walked into someone's apartment and see it, saw an iPad. You're a pixel guy, so you don't even count. <laughs> I, I can still look. I have eyes. Okay, moving on. Live Nation is in its villain era, and it's loving every minute of it. The company that owns the reviled Ticketmaster posted its strongest quarter ever thanks to Taylor Swift, Beyonce, and all the other bands that went on sold out mega tours this summer the company sold 140 million tickets to its shows so far this year which is already way more than 121 million it sold last year in total so even though it's got the doj breathing down its neck after it botched the eras tour ticket release about one year ago live nation only sees better times ahead next year coldplay metallica pink bruno mars aerosmith the foo fighters and ed sheeran are all touring and about half the expected show count for next year is already booked for large venues. My takeaway is people really miss concerts during the pandemic. Oh, this one makes a ton of sense. We All we talked about this summer was Taylor Swift and Beyonce um, and who sells those tickets, Live Nation. I, what was interesting, though, is a lot of people were kind of saying, all right, well, is are your sales going to fall? Because obviously... Taylor Swift and Beyonce can't be on tour forever, but the uh, CFO said no artist is going to account for more than 1% of the tickets we sell, so no one or two will ever hurt us year over year. So I w did think it was interesting that he was kind of saying, we are more than just Taylor and Beyonce. There are plenty of artists out there, and they all contribute to the whole of Live Nation. Yeah, and meanwhile, they, the DOJ is investigating yeah. uh, Live Nation. It says it's not for antitrust concerns because there was that merger between Live Nation and Ticketmaster that a lot of lawmakers have uh, have major concerns about and they say that live nation is a monopoly in the in the concert space uh the, the live nation uh ceo said it wasn't about anti this investigation is not about antitrust and is more about its business practices but we'll see how that plays out yeah it's could be a could be a bit of a threat to the company up next starbucks had an awesome quarter let me paint the picture of where it's currently at as a business first off the fall season went swimmingly since bringing back its iconic line of pumpkin spice flavored drinks back in august u.s and north american and same source sales grew 8% and the company saw record record-breaking average weekly sales overall. Store traffic is also up 3%. Unlike Apple, China was a bright spot for Starbucks as foot traffic increased 8%, leading to a 5% bump in same-store sales as well. And now we have the Christmas season on deck. It's a good time to be Starbucks. So what's my big takeaway? Starbucks is going ham in the international markets. Three out of every four new stores over the near term are expected to be open outside the U.S. And eventually it, it plans to expand to 35,000 locations outside of North America by 2030, up from just 20,000 right now. Neil, overall, a great quarter for Starbucks as it beat on both earnings and revenue, and shares are up 9.5%. Yeah, uh, its stock was ripping after this report. Uh, what was interesting to me was that it's leaning into these fancy drinks, because mm -hmm. that's where they have the best margins, and they're commanding ridiculously high prices. Those sugary syrups, all those things that people customize, and you, ha and you have to wait in line for five minutes behind them. That has been a huge problem for Starbucks, but they're undergoing this you know, revolution behind the scenes to try to speed up that process, but it seems like they're not discouraging its their customers from ordering these drinks and only encouraging them to do it more because each one each time you get another pump on it it's another dollar in their pocket yeah and as soon and every time they can save a few minutes while serving those drinks that's another dollar in starbucks pocket so they're like sure order them but we're just going to get better at making them. it's if you live in another country expect way more starbucks so that, that is the big yeah okay i want to talk about novo nordisk and eli Lilly, the two pharma companies that are making more money than god thanks to their revolutionary diabetes and weight loss drugs they're only only problem right now, and it's a good one to have, is making sure there's enough supply to fill rabid demand. Yesterday, Denmark-based Novo said revenue grew 29% from a year ago to $8.4 billion. Wagovi and Ozempic accounted for more than half of those sales. Eli Lilly's revenue soared 37% to $9.5 billion thanks to its diabetes drug Manjaro. It's hard to comprehend how big these companies have gotten thanks to this new class of drug known as GLP-1 agonists. Novo Nordisk shares are up more than 50% this year to become the most valuable company in Europe. And Eli Lilly has quietly become the most valuable pharma company in the world with a market cap of $550 billion. Investors are so hype about these drugs potential and Novo and Lilly are the two dominant players in the space. This is a run for the ages. Yeah, I think the question now is how do you expand what these drugs treat? Novo is already evaluating how semaglutide, which is the active ingredient in uh, Ozempic, 
affects conditions from arthritis to alcohol abuse. And remember in October, they ran this kidney failure study that they actually halted early because it was so clearly effective. So there is a lot more room to run here as they apply this technology to new diseases. All right, Neil, finally, we have a company that didn't actually report any earnings, but still had a major stock swing, WeWork. WeWork stock fell 53% over the past week after news leaked that it planned to file for plans to file for bankruptcy potentially as soon as next week. Neil, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot more when it does eventually file, but holy moly, the fall from grace is complete. This was a company that was once valued at $47 billion at the peak of the SoftBank era of free money, the current market cap, 59 million. Neil, truly the end or almost the end of an era. Just possibly the worst, le worst managed business we've seen uh, in recent years. As of June, WeWork was paying over $2.7 billion a year in rent and interest, which was more than 80% of its entire revenue. It locked into these long-term leases in 2018 and 2019 when there were low interest rates and the office market was flush. Now we know that all of those things are different. We're in a new era and WeWork just hasn't been able to dig out of this hole at all. I can't wait to dig further into what a crazy run they were. What a crazy company. All right, before we get lost in the stocks forever, we're going to take a quick break. It's Friday, which means it's time for our stock of the week, dog of the week segment, where we look at one stock that liked the new AI Beatles song and one stock that clearly has horrible taste in music. But Neil, I know a lot of our listeners must be thinking, wait a second, they just covered five stocks at the beginning of the show. Now we're getting two more. Well, this week, we decided to embrace a more liberal definition of the word stock and basically just chose something that we thought had a good or bad week in general. I won the pre-show game of Guess the Movie soundtrack, so I'm up first, and my modified stock of the week is the iconic Adidas shoe, Sambas. Neil, this has been the year of the Samba, an absolute classic dating all the way back to 1950. Sambas have seen a resurgence in the post-Kanye West era at Adidas, as everyone from hardcore sneakerheads to celebs have turned to the iconic look to fill the void. Modernizing its historical backlog has typically, typically been something that Adidas struggles with, but for whatever reason, people are once again digging Sambas. And honestly, there's not an exact reason for why they've made a comeback. Retro shoes in general have been having a moment as we've moved away from big, chunky platform shoes to more funky, sporty silhouettes. Plus, the company also got a boost from the release of its $500 super shoe that helped Ethiopia's Tiggs Asefa break the women's marathon record in September. But it could just come down to the price. You can still snag a good pair of Sambas for under, under 100 bucks, which is becoming a rarity in today's shoe game. Neil, I love Sambas. Are you a fan? That surprised me i thought they were 60 dollars. they well they go did they used to be 60 they used to be 60 now they're a little bit more towards 90 but i guess i'm not a part of this craze because i looked at the prices and i, I didn't know that they were around 100 dollars. i thought it was kind of the everyman shoe you could get it for 60 dollars. this was very surprising i haven't really seen sambas in the wild i definitely had a pair when i was a kid great shoe but i really couldn't believe this stat on their growth i just like needed to check it a million times apparently they sold under 1 million pairs of their retro models last year and this year they're ramping up production to hit 15 million they're killing what? it it's across not just sambas it's yeah, across some of the more classic ones but i do just really think that people have been loving like these iconic shoes and uh i mean you have the nike blazers you have the nike cortezes nike's always been really good at kind of going back and mining their heritage adidas has always not quite been as good but I do think that Sambas are just one of those shoes that are so classic. You can release different colorways, yeah. and that's a big thing. It's good for collectors. It's been on a bunch of celebrities' feats as well. Rihanna actually was spotted wearing them, even though she has a shoe deal with Puma, which is uh, Adidas' big rival over in Germany. So I do think that Sambas are awesome, and it's led to a great year for Adidas as well. Adidas shares are up about 30% so far this year, lapping Nike, who's down 14%. So... Again, in the post Kanye West era, a lot of people were nervous. What is Adidas going to do? I guess look back in history. Okay, my dog of the week is HBO and Max CEO Casey Bloys. Look, we were all bored during the pandemic, but most of us didn't create fake Twitter accounts to attack critics of our TV shows. 
which is what Blois did. On Wednesday, a Rolling Stone report revealed that Blois directed a so-called secret army of colleagues to chirp reporters and TV critics on Twitter that said bad things about HBO shows like Perry Mason and Mayor of Easttown. At an HBO event yesterday, Blois owned up to doing it, saying he was working from home and doing an unhealthy amount of scrolling through Twitter, and I came up with a very, very dumb idea to vent my frustration. Big Shots creating secret Twitter accounts to defend themselves and express how they really feel is nothing new, but it is a bit surprising coming from Blois since he was a pretty rock-solid reputation and is known as an easygoing fella. Look, of course this is super embarrassing, but I also don't know how you say anything bad about Mayor of Easttown. I know. That, that was a great show. It was a fantastic show. Neil, I want a burner account. Everyone has wished they could just clap back at a person here and there. It's usually a sports thing, too. Remember, Kevin Durant famously had one. But I think there needs to be more in media because why you spend all this time like putting all this love into a show and then some critic bashes it. Like, I What would you do with one? I, I'm not telling. That's the that's the rule number one of, of burner accounts. You never give a hint as to what you uh, what you're gonna do with it. Okay, we have to move on. You must be this tall to listen to this story because it's about an amusement park mega merger. Six Flags and Cedar Fair are getting in the log flume together in a two billion dollar deal that will create a summer playground powerhouse. Together, the companies will operate 27 amusement parks, 15 water parks, and nine resort properties in North America. Six Flags, you all know from the Six Flags branded parks across the U.S., including the one five minutes from my house in Massachusetts. Cedar Fair has opted to keep its parks with local branding. Its flagship property is Cedar Point in Ohio, but it also owns Knott's Berry Farm in California, Dorney Park in Pennsylvania, and many others. The tie-up comes during a rough patch for amusement parks, which are seeing declining attendance even as Americans flock to other recreational activities like live music and sporting events. Six Flags, for instance, recorded 20.4 million visits last year, a 26% decline from 2021. At least to me, this feels a little bit like JetBlue and Spirit merging. Two smaller fish hoping that linking up will give them the skill to compete with the big guns like Universal, Disney, and SeaWorld. Yeah, I can see the scale argument here. Their combined attendance over the last 12 months was 48 million, which is a lot of people, Neil. And so I do see that there could be a better value offering. Say you buy a season pass, now you have so many different parks that you can uh, have entry It's to. what a lot of the ski resorts have done with the Vail Right. So even though, Empire. yes, they are not that top tier of gold standard of the, the Disney's, the Universal of the world, I think they can make up for it in scale and some of these cost-cutting measures. The intellectual property angle is is interesting as well because Six Flags has long used characters from the Looney Tunes and also DC Comics at its parks, and then Cedar Fair has the rights to some Peanuts characters like Snoopy. So maybe there's some sort of like MCU like universe where they can get Snoopy and the Looney Tunes all together in one. So I think the IP angle is interesting. All right, amusement parks are just becoming more theme parks this, these days with the IPification of everything. <laughs> Disney is is not building any theme park, right? It's all based on its IP, the Star Wars stuff, the Harry Potter stuff, like that. I mean, that's not uh, that's not Disney, but this is the way theme parks are going. Uh, and Cedar Fair has long been known for its crazy roller coasters, yeah. which I won't touch. Oh, you're not a you're not I a can't even go guy. on the uh, teacups. Oh my gosh, Neil, you're better than that. <laughs> but but it's been interesting to watch Six Flags try to revolution its, uh, revolutionize itself. Uh, in the face of declining attendance, it does not want to be known as a teen hangout anymore. And what it did was raise prices so it would entice more families to come. The CEO said it wants to become Stroller Palooza. And because, you know, every every uh, company wants to be be a part of the family budget because they can spend. Yeah. You spend on four people instead of one. And Six Flags is jacking up its prices uh, to try to court more families and beautify its parks. Yeah. Everyone is fighting for what's short leisure time we have so you, you got to come with your with your big guns if you want a, a chunk of americans leisure time for our final story of the week neil i want to talk about daylight savings times this upcoming sunday at 2 a.m your clocks will fall back one hour this change gives early risers an extra hour of daylight while robbing us of some precious sun in the evenings. Neil, there is a spirited debate on whether daylight savings should exist at all, with plenty of evidence on both sides of its pros and cons. Health groups and sleep experts have called for an end to the seasonal shifting of clocks for a long time now due to how it wrecks sleep patterns. People are more prone to error due to sleep deprivation in the days after daylight savings times begins. 
And some studies estimate that it could cost the U.S. $434 million in lost productivity annually. But on the plus side, daylight savings gives consumers more daylight to shop and spend money, which retailers and restaurants like. Plus, last time we got rid of it back in the 70s, it was reverted in less than a year after the early morning darkness proved dangerous for school children. So, Neil, I am very curious to hear your stance on this. Are you team DST or not? I am team permanent standard time. I think it's very important to have light in the morning and we should over index on light in the morning rather than light in the evening because maybe it's a little worse for the economy as people don't do as much leisure stuff in the evening if it gets a little light later. But I think it's really important to have light in the morning for your circadian rhythm. I think it's really important for kids to go to school when it's light out. I don't think it's as important to be, you know, I don't think the eight to 9 p.m. hour being light in the evening is going to make a huge difference for the economy or anybody else in general. So while it may be more fun individually to have a little to have it lighter in the evenings, I think we as a society, it is much better for us, for our health, for everything else to have more daylight in the mornings. That's I my I mean, that's I, my opinion. I, that's spoken like a true morning person, I will say. So uh, honestly, though, I do think this thing will never change because of the children's darkness thing. Because I don't think you can send children to school in the dark. Like, how are you ever going to They're gonna doing it right that? now. It doesn't get light out until 7.45. I know, but that's exactly why it, it's it's ending right now. Because now they give some more light in the, in the morning. So I don't know. It, it, on the one hand, you are discussing, like, employee morale. And, like, daylight hours can boost productivity. But also... I mean, you, you got kids going to school at the dark, so it's always going to be an interesting debate in terms of like economics versus like social, social good. So in 2022, Marco Rubio introduced the Sunshine Protection Act, which would make permanent daylight savings. And that has kind of languished in Congress. It passed the House, but the Senate hasn't taken it up. Uh, and I, I really can't say how much I hate this bill, because if you look at what would, uh, you know, where cities would have the, the latest sunrise yeah. under permanent daylight savings, it's kind of crazy. Indianapolis, the latest sunrise would be 9.06 a.m. Oh, under this. Can you imagine this not having a sunrise till 9.06? <laughs> I, I don't like that. Again, spoken. that like spooks me out. That does. That is a little creepy. But again, we're morning people, Neil, I guess. Either way, this Sunday, you get an extra hour of sleep. Thank goodness. I think what the overall vibe among, among Americans, whether you want permanent daylight savings or permanent standard time, is they don't want switching. Yeah. It's so too, it's literally just like pick one and we'll live with the consequences. But the switching, you know, causes a spike in heart attacks. It is just a problem for, you know, parents with a lot of kids who, you know, their their sleep schedule is way off. The switching is bad. So Pick one, and I say pick standard time. I'm excited for the extra hour. That's all I'll say. All right, we have to wrap it up there. What a week. This weekend will be the first time in eight weekends. It won't rain in New York. So if you're in the Northeast, I hope you find some time to be outside. Maybe support the apple orchards that have been taking a massive hit. While we won't have any shows in the next two days, you can always reach us at Morning Brew Daily at MorningBrew.com. Toby loves checking the inbox before going out to the club, so he may respond to you. <laughs> Let's roll the credits. Emily Milliron is our editor and producer. Samantha Velas and Raymond Liu are associate producers. Yuchenawa Ogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and makeup also can't wait for the extra hour of sleep. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. I wish you all well. 